Hey, Josh. Hey, Don. Did you color your hair? It is. It's purple. Cool. <laughs> So what happens when you get bored during a pandemic. Okay. You know, I'm actually just, have, one of the things is that one of the reasons I had to avoid PyCon in 2018 was I'd promised if I went, I was going to color my hair. <laughs> and my hair is super dry. So I know if I colored it, I would end up having to cut it short afterwards because it would be too dry and brittle. Mm-hmm. The, um, so. Yeah, I got mine. Well, the first, uh, I go to a professional and she, she does most of it. And then I just sort of touch it up mm -hmm. to keep it bright because it doesn't stay bright for that long. So I've been going for ages to get like the, the gray yeah. discovered up. Yeah. 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 But I usually just got normal hair color, you know, like brown. Same color as my regular hair. This is the first time I've done anything bright, unnatural. I kind of like it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, on um, on video, it mostly looks black. It does. Yeah, that's the thing. Like in real life, it's actually quite bright, but. But video doesn't do purple, I guess. <laughs> yeah, not very well. Well, it also depends on I've you know I have one of these lights and has different colors, and so if, if I use this one, it looks kind of red purple. If I use this one, it, my hair looks completely blue. Wow. Well. We're waiting. I think it's time that we need to pester the existing um, K Native steering committee. Yeah. Yeah, we need to, because April said that she was having some conversations with people, but they were out on holiday. Yeah, so if actually. Not, if she's not eligible to be an election officer, we need a new one. Yep. And. Um, And of course, Bob Killen works for Google now. So if they want somebody from Google. Hmm. The, yeah, um, Because he ran the election process, what was it, last year? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it would be good to know. And it'd be good to know what they expect in terms of a schedule because we're already past the original schedule I proposed. Yeah. Um, the, um, and I'm also not all that clear on how many people are being elected. So. No, it's not that clear because of the, the transition stuff isn't, I don't know, it seems to contradict the other stuff just a little bit. It didn't get updated after they eliminated the end user positions. Yeah. So the, um, which I'm still sad about, but the, Is there um, a public steering committee meeting we can drop into? Um, get answers to our questions live? Yeah, but not for like a week. Hmm. We can have. There was so, one tomorrow or Thursday. Um, I don't know, actually, because, right, they were supposed to make more of their meetings public after the charter change, but there wasn't a specific schedule attached to that. Mm -hmm. And it really is true that like half of the K Native principals took the week off last week. Yeah. Um, because I've been trying to get some stuff done internally for promoting K Native. And, you know, people just did not start returning my messages until yesterday. So, um, the, um, hmm. Are we not getting anybody else? 
Amy said, based on the agenda, it didn't look like she needed to be here. No. So she said, she texting didn't. her if she needs, if, if we need her. Yep. She didn't. I guess when we're not um, arguing about steering committees, people are not really interested. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> steering committees are boring. And if they're not boring, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, because um, I only had a couple of things, um, mostly, and honestly, one of them should have been on the general meeting last week, except we didn't have a general meeting because something went weird with the calendar for a bunch of us. Um, uh, the, um, which is, we need to start preparing for the session for um, uh, KubeCon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're supposed to have our recording done by the, so the 22nd, I think. Something like that, yeah. So kind of need to have an outline and stuff yeah. and decide who's recording what. And obviously we need some of the people from, we need at least like Carolyn there as well um, The um, for the contributor growth portions of things. Um, the, um, I mean, what I was seeing was about 10 minutes going over, you know, here's your project checklist at the different levels of maturity. You know, here's the things that you're expected to have or should have. Um, and then open it up to the Q&A where we'll actually find out who's participating and help them through specific things mm -hmm. that they need to have. How much time do we think we want to devote to the presentation part of it? I, I was suggesting 10 minutes. Okay. Um, which is about enough time to go over our sort of tree of things that projects should have. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, if you can think of a way to make that slightly more engaging than a laundry list, I've been trying to come up with one. It's hard to make paperwork engaging, Josh. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> the um, and again, like in real project time, if the paperwork is super engaging, then it's because there's a problem. So yeah. <laughs> yeah um, so um, the um. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the most engaging thing would be to take an existing project that has a relatively incomplete paperwork profile and go over what's there and not there. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the timing for that is impossible. Right, we would have to find such a project now and count on and count on them uh, being incomplete for long enough for us to um, record the video. Ah, uh, yeah. The, um, so, like say, hey, you know, they have a contributing.md thing here, but it doesn't actually tell you how to contribute. Um, <laughs> the, um, or, you know, and they're missing anything about who their current reviewers, you know, who their current owners are. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, um, so, um, yeah, but I was basically thinking for the recording, we'd split it up into segments for each of us mm -hmm. because I don't have, I'm not prepared to set up the technology to actually record us. Well, we could record us as sort of a panel if we were to do it via um, conference call stuff, like we recorded via Zoom. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, I think that's probably a, a fine option. I mean, it's just, it's just 10 minutes. 
we could mm -hmm. record it. I think I think recording it via Zoom is probably probably the easiest way. Because one of us could share the screen and we could each have, I don't know, a couple of slides or something. Mm -hmm. However, at the end of my day, after a day full of meetings, I, I'm not sure how much creativity I have to offer this uh, finding something yeah. engaging solution. Yeah. Well, that's another reason to keep the presentation part of things short. Mm -hmm. The um, so that we can, you know, go straight to helping people with the actual problems they have. Yeah. The so. Uh, Uh, okay, so we'll want to, so we need to actually, we need to create an outline, we need to, I mean, one of the reasons why I like the idea of having a project to look at if we could find one um, would be um, that it would allow us to do something that wasn't just slides. Yeah. Like possibly not do slides at all, except the, you know, name of the session slide, mm -hmm. because we actually could go back and forth between, you know, a checklist document and um, a, um, um, a checklist document and a um, and looking at a project, and mm -hmm. that's going to be more engaging than looking at a bunch of slides. Yeah. The um, plus, it's stuff that people can refer to later. Um, yeah, I like that idea. Okay. Okay, that does mean that we need to finish with contributor growth, preparing a sort of master checklist document document for the various levels of maturity. You know, saying, "Hey, this is what these are the things you're expected to have at this level of maturity, and these are the things that are good to have, regardless of whether or not they're required." Mm -hmm. um, the um, so, um, who was the, working on that? Nobody has been, so we need to start it. Yeah, okay. I mean, we kind of have that with our content, mm -hmm. our list of content that's required. Mm -hmm. Um, the um, um, you know, and so it would just be converting parts of that to. A checklist. Mm -hmm. The um, and then getting uh, contrib growth to make sure that all of their stuff is in there. So, oh, the problem is just time between now and the twenty second, because that's oh, yeah. <laughs> Seven business oh, days yeah. away and all things open smack in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fortunately not speaking at all things open. The bigger problem for me is that I'm also responsible for a lot of Red Hat's commercial KubeCon stuff. Mm -hmm. 
the um, so the yeah, I honestly thought I would have more time to work on this in September. Um, than than I ended up having. Yeah. Mostly because I didn't think I'd be spending most of my September on non CNCF projects. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I feel your pain there. Um, maybe we should just start that master checklist doc, mm -hmm. Google doc right now, throw it in the okay. minutes. And that way yep. we can both add to it. And maybe um, if you want to ping uh, Caroline and have her yeah. add some stuff to it. Because if we get it started and then we can all just add bits and pieces to it, maybe that, maybe it'll go faster. Because I might have some time between meetings tomorrow. I'll put it on my to-do list. Sorry, were you creating that or are you waiting for me to create that? I am creating it. Okay, just checking. <laughs> that way we're not both staring at each other waiting for the other one to do something. Yep. Okay, there's the link. It's blank right now, obviously. So. Should good, good to have regardless be above entering sandbox, like the things that you should have anyways, and then. Yeah, okay. Well, that's actually a requirement for entering sandbox. Well, I was thinking good to have regardless is stuff that every project needs. Oh, even if they're not going to join the CNCF. Yeah. The um, It's going to be repetitive, a lot of things that are required. I wonder if you should just get rid of that. They, what I was thinking about good to have regardless um, is stuff that's not actually a requirement um, and some projects don't necessarily have. Um, like, so maybe, maybe like nice to have additions. And if that's the case, I would put it back at the bottom. Yeah. Additional. Oh, I can reword that later. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. By the way, I made my proposal um, that uh, the CNCF should consider having a joint code of conduct committee for all of the smaller projects. Yeah. Crickets. 
<laughs> They're willing to spend, I don't know how many meetings arguing about steering committees. Yeah. But, you know, code of conduct enforcement, no. That's something we're, we're going to gonna... need to, because lots of people aren't good at code of conduct enforcement. And if we have yeah, some well, people who are like spot on trained. Yeah. Well, and right now the setup is if, you know, if you're not Kubernetes or I think Helm, co code of conduct enforcement is carried out by Angela at the Linux mm -hmm. Foundation. Yeah. And if Angela's on vacation. Yep. The, um, not that Angela really takes vacations, but I don't think we should reinforce that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so, um, the, um, also, you know, I haven't said this to, you know, the CNCF folks, but there's also the issue that if the code of conduct complaint is against a member of the Linux Foundation event staff, mm -hmm. that's going to be a huge conflict of interest for Angela. Yeah. The, um, so, um, okay. The, um, so what else we got here? Oop. Not have it disappear. Let's look at our content checklist. I just sent this to just tag Carolyn in a Slack message with the link. Yeah, so there's actually only three things required of Sandbox. I almost wonder if good to have is actually per level because <clears throat> um, because even though having a governance that MD is not actually required until incubation, it gets discussed. Mm -hmm. Um, the, um, okay, so let's see.
Well, there's something that's actually currently nobody's responsibility. Oh, conformance. But it's really, yeah, and I realize that is an expectation of the CNCF, and it kind of. I mean, we isn't there a conformance working group for CNCF? I thought there was. I'm actually going to put those three things under good to have, nice to have in general, because mm -hmm. those actually are good examples of things that could be introduced at any stage, are not tied to specific requirements, except in a loose sense. Yeah. Um, I kind of think the CIA best practices probably requires having the security report handling, um, but I haven't delved into it. I think you actually have to have the adopters at the incubating stage, don't you? If you look at, so the, the doc I'm looking at right now is this one. Which has it at the graduating stage. Yeah, okay. Okay, then I'll move that from requirements to good to have. Yeah. So it's actually kind of weird because at the incubating stage, it says that you have to document that it's used by at least three independent end users, mm -hmm. which is the adopters. Yeah. So it's weird that those two things are phrased entirely different ways, even though they're the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's interesting because for, for graduating, it doesn't give any number of adopters. No. Well, the presumption is that you got the three in order to get yeah. to incubating. Yeah. And, and that three is enough. No, there's no increased number. Yeah. Um, so the, um, I guess the one difference is that technically 
the list of end users could be less public at the incubating stage. That is, it could be a document you furnish only mm -hmm. to the CNCF uh, SIGs and not something you have published in your project. Yeah. Although I've never actually seen that. Because, um, I mean, at least having gone through it with projects, we're always saying, can we publicly reference you? Because yeah, CNCF committees have publicly recorded meetings. So nothing's actually private. It's just um, annoying to find. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and the clear versioning scheme kind of implies the existence of a defined release process. Yeah, exactly. Um, although you could get around that. Um, but obviously having a defined release process is the better way to go there. Yeah. Um, because then you're not, <laughs> what version is this is not a matter of opinion anymore. <laughs> the, um, although um, it's not really true. <laughs> Having having worked on both uh, Firefox and uh, Postgres, <laughs> you can have a very defined release process, and version numbers can still be a matter of opinion. <laughs> the, um, so, well, I'm still like not sure know. whether I should be proud or ashamed of um, of having converted Firefox to whole integers for version numbers. It just feels weird to be getting like version 103 of Firefox. On yeah. the other hand, the versioning number scheme we had before then was truly nightmarish. <laughs> it was like 3.5.33.7 dash um, uh, alpha B. <laughs> and that would be like a release version. <laughs> I, I, they, you know, the way that I actually got people to switch versioning numbers was that um, I merged a page long uh, function written in Perl to <laughs> interpret the version numbers. Um, and the folks at Mozilla hated Perl. And I was like, okay, well, try rewriting this in Python. I tried. It was. This is one of the areas where Perl really shines. The <laughs> Python version was four times as long. Um, and they changed the version numbers rather than <laughs> have to use Perl. The, um, oh, anything to avoid some Perl. Uh, you know, whatever works. <laughs> the um, I was reading the civs code and was surprised to find I could still read Perl. The, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to at this point. I mean, I wrote some Perl back in the 90s, and that's, I, I don't remember any of it. I wrote whole applications in Perl 5, so. Yeah. The um, Plus, the thing about Perl, like, I don't know, being able to write your own Perl and being good enough to read other people's Perl are two completely mm. different things. It depends on who the writer is. I mean, it does help that the civs code came out of academia. Um, and therefore, it's actually written to be read, um, reviewed by faculty who might not actually be programmers. Yeah. And and as a result, a lot of things that could have been rolled up into Perl one-liners were not, which makes it much easier to read. Yeah. Um, the um, so which is good because the vote counting algorithms are not obvious. Hmm. Okay, well, I feel like we've got a pretty good start. Yeah. If you don't add anything to it, we can keep it to a page. Um, yep. We'll see what Carolyn says if she has anything to add to it. Okay. But I think this is a really good start.
Okay. Yeah. And I think if we had all of that, we would have stuff for people and then they could start pitching questions of, yeah. hey, I'm pitching my project to Sandbox. Do I need X? Or I need X and what does that look like? Yeah. Um, so, and then we're going to ask everybody to look around and see if they know a project that is um, um, relatively incomplete that we could take a look at before it gets altered. Yeah. Do we want to put this in the uh, in the GitHub repo? Yes. Okay. But um, but let's finish it out on on docs. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So that we can collaboratively edit it, and then yes, no, we definitely want it in the GitHub repo um, as a document that people can download. Yeah. Um, as a matter of thing... fact, I think that some mature version of this should eventually go into the templates yeah. project. Yeah. Since it is a checklist mm -hmm. for projects. Yeah. The other thing I think we should do um, before we publish it on GitHub is maybe include links to good examples of these. Yeah. So do we have a governance MD that's a good example of something? Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, actually, eventually what we want to have in our thing, possibly before we give the actual talk, um, is both links to examples and links to any of the documentation we have so far published around these mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Um, yep. The, you can um, link to the leadership selection doc here. Right. Yep. Cool. So what are what are next steps? Um, I don't think we can rely on just the the meetings that we have to finish this no. because we just don't have enough time. Yeah. Should we try to set something up for, for later this week for the three of us to chat so we can pull Carolyn into it? Yeah. Yeah, I think we better. I'm on PTO on Friday. Oh, so am I actually, so not Friday. <laughs> I could do, how early do you start? What's your typical start? Um, usually 8 a.m. Pacific. Okay. Um, because I could do. And the problem is that like if I start at seven, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly an evening person. So I can attend a meeting at seven, but I tend to be not very contributor. Yep. Nope, that's cool. Um, if you could work with uh, Carolyn, because this is, I'm pretty right. much gonna be done at this point, but I could do, I could do Wednesday mm -hmm. um, after 9 a.m. Pacific. Okay. Preference for earlier. And I could do, I could do Thursday at 10.30 Pacific. So if you could find a time that works for both you and Carolyn and maybe just like mm -hmm. drop a meeting on the calendars, that would be, that would be cool. Okay. Okay. Cool. Is there anything else we need to talk about? No, no. Okay. As usual, we have enough work to do that we don't actually need to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Agreed. No, okay. what we should talk about with Carolyn is which parts of the checklist we each want to cover and then mm -hmm. figure out how to make that work in a talking record us format. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. Great talking to you. Take care.